Right, there's a lot of vocabulary for chapter two. So I'll, go, I'll point out some of these. So conditionals are written as if-then statements. A converse is when you switch the hypothesis and conclusion around. So you change the order of the if and the then. The hypothesis is after the if. The conclusion is after the then. A biconditional is one you can reverse both. You can reverse the conditional, so the converse is true, and the conditional is true. So you can slip in an if and only if in between. A good definition can be written as a biconditional, which means it's reversible. The law of detachment is if you know that P of Q, P implies Q is true and P is true, it means that Q must be true as well. Law of syllogism is if P implies Q is true and Q implies P R is true, then P implies R is true. Transitive property, if you know that A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. It kind of reminds me of the law of syllogism. Reflexive property is just A equals A, the exact same thing on the right and left side. Symmetric is all you do is reverse what's on the left side with the right side. So that's an example of the symmetric. And also make sure you know the angle addition postulate, the segment addition postulate, and the vertical angle theorem. When writing the converse, you need to change the hypothesis and conclusion. So I'm going to write if x equals 8, then x plus 2 equals 10. Then it wanted to determine the truth value of each. So the first one, if x plus 2 equals 10, then x equals 8 is true. The converse, if x equals 8, then 8 plus 2 equals 10 is also true. So both of them are true, which means I could actually write it as a biconditional. My biconditional would be x plus 2 equals 10 if and only if x equals 8. Number two, write as a conditional statement. So we need to have an if, then a then. So every freshman is going to the football game. I'm going to write it out. I wrote out if a person is a freshman, then they are going to the football game. So we need to have an if then. Three, identify the hypothesis and conclusion. The hypothesis is after the if, and the conclusion is after the then. Don't underline the if and the then. The if and the then are not considered the hypothesis or conclusion. Make sure, make sure that you know the law of syllogism and law of detachment. So I wrote out the law of syllogism. And the law of detachment is if you know P implies Q is true and P is true, then Q is true. So if you know that P implies Q is true, you can't say that just because Q is true, P is true. It's so make sure you know the definitions of each, okay? Um, number five, apply it. So this is when you have to mark your P's, Q's, and R's. So an object as a square, that's a P. Then it is a rhombus. That's a Q. The object is a rhombus. That's a Q. Then it is equilateral. That is an R. So I have P implies Q. Q implies R situation. So my conclusion is going to be a sentence. It's going to be P implies R written as a sentence. So if an object is a square, then it is equilateral. So make sure when you're writing a conclusion, you either write no, nothing can be concluded or write it as a sentence. Okay, we have a proof, so we're always going to write two columns. I write my conclusion, my justifications. First thing I do is I write my given. So I'm going to write AB, the segment, is congruent to CD, the segment, by given. Now I'm going to go over and mark it. AB is congruent to CD. My second 
given the next line, CD is congruent to EF, and that's given. I'm going to mark this one with a squiggly. CD is equal to EF. Okay, so I have to conclude that AB is congruent to EF, so I'm going to write that on my last line, and then I'll get to that. I want my final line to be what I have to prove. So I'm looking at what I already know here. So I know that the red ones, these two are congruent, and I know that these two are congruent. So if this was 6 and this was 6, then this would have to be 6, right? So what property is going on right here? If AB is congruent to CD and CD is congruent to EF, what property is? How can we conclude that AB is congruent to EF? Well, that's by the transitive property. So let's, I'm done with my proof. Be ready to fill in a proof. So I have my given. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. So on this line, I'm going to fill in these lines here so it's easier to follow. So the, the line for number 1 is going to be given. Go mark it on your diagram. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. Number 2, why is angle 3 plus angle 2 equal to A, B, E, B, A? Why is 2 plus 3 equal to the right angle? That is by the angle addition postulate. And then angle EBA is equal to angle 1 plus angle 2. Huh, where did that come from? So I don't see it on my diagram, so I'm going to look up here. Why is angle EBA equal to 1 plus 2? Well, if I look down the previous line, it's so close, it's angle 3 plus 2. So instead of writing 1 plus 2, we wrote 3 plus 2. So that is because of this right here. Angle 1 is equal to angle 2. The measures are equal. So I must have substituted. So instead of writing angle 3, I wrote measure of angle 1 and just put it right here. So that's substitution. In angle 4, why is the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equal dBC? Well, 1 plus 2 is that yellow angle, so that is by the angle addition postulate. <laughs> okay, so why does the measure of angle EBA equal dBC? Why is the yellow one equal to the red one? So... If I look at the previous th two lines, these two right here, 1 plus 2 is equal to EBA, and 1 plus 2 is equal to DBC. This is an example of the transitive property. I'd also be okay if you wrote substitution, too. So I could write it out so it looks friendly. I'll write out 3 and 4 so it looks like transitive property. So A equals B. B equals C. That's why A equals C. Okay, and then I, they're going to have to do some angle problems solving for X or Y. So the relationship between these two angles is that they add up to 90. They're complementary. So I wrote out my equation right here, 2x plus 4x equals 90, solve for x, and then I plugged it back in. So the two angles are 30 and 60. And the second one, the relationship is to add to 180. So I combine like terms, solve for x, x is 8. Now I can plug this back in. So 14 times 8 is 2, 3, 112. So if this is 112 degrees, this has to be 68 degrees because they add up to 180. To write a biconditionalist two statements, I underline the hypothesis and conclusion. And I'm going to do the hypothesis. If a polygon is a triangle, then it has three sides. 
and now I'm going to reverse it. So I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to write if the conclusion, then the hypothesis. So if a polygon has three sides, then it's a triangle. And the last one, determine whether it's a good definition. So you should be able to write it as a biconditional. Skew lines are lines that never intersect. So if the lines are skew, then they never intersect. That's true. Now I'm going to reverse it. If the lines never intersect, then they're skew. Is that true? Can you think of lines that never intersect that are not skew? That would be the counterexample. This is actually false because parallel lines never intersect. So this definition is not reversible. So it's not a good definition because you can't write it as a biconditional.